Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Deviant Mind. This is Dominica. And this is Chris. And today we have the insane case of Lori Vallo Daybell, which is completely nutty. We were having a conversation right before we started um, recording and we're like, oh my gosh, we have got to get this recorded because of the fact we have a lot of ideas because this case is so strange, like so many different players in it. The timeline spans years. Um, the kids are, well, we're going to go over the main players, but, um, and we are not sure because she's so insane, uh, but she knows exactly what she's doing, but she doesn't think that murdering her children was bad because they're having such a great time in the afterlife, which goes back to the fact that she's, you know, completely nuts. Um, so yeah, I also just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, in, in our past few episodes, we've been focusing on female killers and I've noticed, and it's probably like a duh moment, but females tend to kill those they love, those they know, Mm -hmm. whereas men are more prone to just kill at random people they don't know. So I find that very interesting. You know, we have the female authors who killed their husbands. We have this case who kills the children. It's, it's you'll ne- you'll rarely I mean even more knows knew her Johns. I mean I just find it very interesting that there's always some sort of relationship that's involved in uh, a woman who murders. Even yeah. Dyer, Amelia Dyer, Dyer knew the people who dropped off the babies and the babies. Right. So I find that really interesting. Right. No. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I mean they do say that women do tend to marry or uh, to kill, not marry to kill for uh, also (laughs) love and money. And this has all the aspects of that. Um, I was just laughing because it made me think of Mary sex kill. Oh, right, right, exactly. Um, Okay, so this is a case of a bunch of Mormons too, although it looks like it was a cult that was outside of the Mormon faith that was created by Chad Daybell. And he had been um publishing books and uh actually writing both religious and post-apocalyptic books under his company called spring creek book company back in march 9th 1990 um and both him and his wife tammy they were married in manti utah lived in springfield utah and that is when their whole thing started so 1990 long long time ago and he had these post-apocalyptic leanings way back then. Which were also podcasts. He Which had we- a podcast. And then uh, we got to point out, prior to all this, he was a grave digger. <laughs> of course he did was. Did you know that? He served as a grave digger. I did not know that. Um, yeah. Which is, so because there's like a ton of players in here, I wanted to kind of go through and give you kind of the constellation of people. So we have Lori Vallow Daybell, who um, per her trial just ended several months ago, she is in jail for the murder of her adopted son, Joseph J.J. Vallow, and her daughter from a previous marriage, Tylee Ryan. So- And, and Tammy Daybell. Well, Tammy, yes, Tammy Daybell. So Chad Daybell was married to Tammy Daybell. They also had five kids. Lori had a brother, Alex Cox, who's going to figure prominently in this case. He was her brother. And he had a girlfriend that became his wife named Zuluma Pastenas. I probably mispronounced that. Um, And she becomes integral to Lori's trial. Now, Lori also has a niece named Melanie Pavlovsky, who was married and then divorced to Brandon Boudreaux. They also uh, figure prominently in this case. Um, Her ex-husband, Joseph Ryan, was the father of Tylee Ryan, and he died of a supposed heart attack in 2018. Now, Lori also had a um, a son 
from a previous marriage because she had been married five times. Five times. Uh, named Colby Ryan. And now Charles Vallow, who is a person that, as you will find out, was killed by Lori's brother, Alex. Fourth husband. He was her fourth husband. And he, the, Joseph J.J. Vallow was actually his... So Kay Woodcock is Charles's sister. Kay Woodcock is the biological grandma of Joseph J.J. Vallow. And Joseph J.J. Vallow, we'll just call him J.J. because that's how he was known, was an autistic boy whose parents didn't feel that they would be able to take care of him properly. And so um, Charles, Lori's fourth husband, um, they agreed to take him in and uh, adopt him. So a condition of the adoption was that the Woodcocks would remain in JJ's life. So within a, this was back when Charles and Lori were living in Arizona. And so the Woodcocks, they um, moved to Arizona to be close to him. Um, yeah. So that is kind of the main family. And then we have, uh, Melanie Gibb, who also prom, uh, is prominent in this case, and she is Lori's friend, and she actually testifies against Lori as far as what in the world happened to her um, going <laughs> going into this. So I didn't find that much about JJ and Tylee. Um, I do have some information about Lori, however. She was born Lori Noreen Cox on June 26, 1973 in San Bernardino, California. And she was married for the first time in 1992 to, uh, at 19 years old to her high school sweetheart, Nelson Yanes. But they divorced pretty quickly after. And she was then married to William Lagioa um, in 1995. And that's where her son, Colby um, Ryan, was conceived in, but they were literally only married for like a year. Um, and then her third husband, Joseph Ryan, she married in 2001. They divorced in 2004. And that's uh, Tylee's dad. And there was a recording, supposedly he died of, uh, in 2018 of a, an apparent heart attack, but there was a recording that they found during the trial saying that quote, this is Lori saying, quote, I went through a lot of years of this kind of hard stuff and I was going to murder him. I was going to kill him like the scripture says, like Nephi killed just to stop the pain and to stop him from coming after me and to stop him coming after my children, end quote. Um, but they were not able to find any um, evidence that she actually did kill him. Now, supposedly her sister which i don't think i mentioned in our little biographies of people her name is summer shiflet summer cox shiflet said that her sister was totally okay before 2018 and she was just a devout um lds member she was a devout mormon and everything was great until 2018 but seeing as there's recording saying that she's going to murder her husband due to scriptures, I kind of question that. And maybe her sister wasn't seeing everything that she could um, yeah. <laughs> she could find. Um, I wanted to back up a little uh, and also point out that she grew up with parents who were Mormon. Mm -hmm. She went to Mormon church a lot. Which uh, they do. And, and her mom, Janice, uh, was kind of... It was hard when you saw her to even tell that she was a Mormon because by any stretch of the means, she wasn't really, she dressed really flashy, apparently mm -hmm. wearing tight clothes. And her persona was not very, quote unquote, Mormon-like. So I, I think see. that may have had an effect on a young Lori seeing like, I'm Mormon, I'm religious, but hey, I got it. I have the looks. Uh, later on, as I'm sure we'll get into, she, you know, she's in a pageant. Uh, she's on television, uh, so and she's a beautician, which we can also get into. But so I think that there are things from her childhood that indicate uh, this sort of mixture between religion and looking good. 
You know, you want to look good for God. You want to look good in general for perhaps later meeting a, a, a prophet. Right. Well, and then also it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, supposedly her sister Summer says that she never worked. She was a hairdresser right. for like a short little bit. But when she started getting married, that was it. The husband worked and she was just out and about. Um, but I believe, I believe uh, Chad and Charles and maybe the third husband mm -hmm. uh, were supportive of her to a point where they helped her open a home salon. So she worked out of her house and had a lot of clients. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm kind yeah. of curious because like that her summer said that on record at, in her trial. So it's kind of interesting the way stories change, right? Because yeah. talking about she may not that, have even known. She may not have even known yeah, that, that was a thing. Perhaps. And because there was this thing about uh her killing the kids so she could take their um their benefits because yeah. she was always hard up for cash, that was kind of the the thrust of the argument of why she killed the children. Although, yeah. I mean, I personally think she killed them because she thought they were the dark souls, but we're going to get into that. We'll get into that. And also let's throw in the fact that her other sister, Stacy, uh, passed away of diabetes and she spoke with her every night. Like when she passed, she would uh, be overheard speaking to her sister. And then when she has Tylee, she's convinced that Stacy was reincarnated uh, through state. Uh, Stacy was in Taylor's body or spirit. Stacy actually wound up not taking her meds for diabetes. So it was kind of like this path that she chose where she just didn't care. Probably. Well, that's right. thing. well yeah. it's interesting because I was also reading that she claimed that she had a life and death experience when actually giving birth to Tylee. Yes. And that um, her sister came to her at that point. And that's when she realized she was able to speak to the dead and to the people who had passed on. Yeah. And that she felt that she had a connection to the world of the dead after that. Right. Yeah. So, the, I mean, these are basically, these are the foundations, I feel, that lead up to the ideology that she would come to love and adopt. Yes. So... The Kauai, Hawaii kind of uh, starts early in the story. So we're back in 2014. Um, they adopt J.J. Vallow. They also have um, Tylee with them. They also have Colby with them. Now, when Tylee was born, this is where Lori's niece, Melanie pa Pawlowski, comes into the story. She marries Brandon Bedreau. They have four children, and he Brandon is so close with the with Lori's family that he baptizes Tylee into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Um, and Melanie is important because she is the one that gets into the cult with Lori, as we find out later. Um, so, in 2014, the Vallos they move to Kauai, Hawaii. They have a business there. And at this point, Larry Woodcock, who is Kay Woodcock's uh, husband, they don't visit JJ as frequently as before uh, in Arizona. They just do now phone and FaceTime. And um, after a bit, the Vallos, they move back to Arizona and Kay and Larry are back in JJ's life, which makes them very happy. Um, Kay and uh, Larry are the people who actually um, report JJ and Tylee missing. So they're mm -hmm. very important to the story. Um, so at this point, so we're going to check in with Chad and Tammy. They moved to Salem, Idaho, a city just out of outside of Rexburg with their five kids. Tammy's working as a school librarian. And at this point, Lori starts reading his religious books, meaning Chad Daybell's. And they, his books focus on radical theories of spirituality surrounding the end of the world, hence the post-apocalyptic doomsday second coming of Christ after a big war happens. I'm assuming this is connected to um, the Christianity belief that this is in scriptures um, where I think a large part of like born agains, maybe of the left behind, you know, the left behind series, that's really big. Yeah. So yeah. essentially when 
I think the Jews repopulate Israel. There's a great war. And that's when the second coming of Christ happens. And that's when... Um, Chosens and the Holy Land open up. And- well, yeah. And then and that's when the apocalypse happens. And so the people who are true believers of Christ get to stay on earth and oh. everybody else disappears. So By I think- all accounts, she had a great relationship with her children. And even though JJ uh, was they deemed a difficult child because of his autism. She apparently was fantastic uh, with not only JJ, but her other children. Yeah, she was and called Supermom. Supermom. But at all of her relationships with friends and family and her own children really started to change as she's reading Chad's books. Right, which makes sense because there's a whole thing about dark souls. So what's interesting is... Um, Everything starts going really by the wayside uh, in 2018 for this large extended family. Tylee's father, Joseph Ryan, as we said, dies, and it is ruled a heart attack. And then in the fall of 2018, Lori and Melanie start attending meetings, not sponsored by the Mormon church, and their spouses do not attend. And uh, Melanie reportedly told Brandon, her husband, that the firesides were, quote, her thing. And it was very clear he was not welcome to come. Now, these fireside chats are centered around Chad Daybell's religious books of the apocalypse and, you know, going uh, that the world was going to end soon. And what Brandon said, it was interesting that Melanie, when he married her, was not very religious. But then she started getting super passionate about going to church and certain ideas of the church that were going towards this and the, the end of the world is coming very soon. And now more remember, female, I'm just going to say more, more female followers than male followers. Yeah, which is fascinating, I, I find. So this is October 26, 2018. Lori and Chad Daybell meet at a religious conference in St. George. And Lori's friend, Melanie Gibb, like we spoke about, said that they were really super flirty when they met. And they talked about a lot of beliefs they shared. And I can imagine like uh, Lori has been reading Chad books for years. All of a sudden she gets to meet him as a prophet and can you imagine like the i could imagine hero worship and Lori's a back then kind of a i guess attractive woman of for yeah. her age so yeah. um and supposedly reportedly chad tells Lori that they had been married in a previous life Actually, as james and alana lives. james and alana that's right james and alana and Lori said she totally believed it And so because we're in 2018, we get to have a lot of cell phone data that came out in trial. And so, of course, we have the first evidence of Lori creating a contact for Chad in her phone called Bishop Shumway. And this is the first electronic evidence of their interactions. It's October 28th, 2018. So I guess probably still at the religious conference in St. George. And... So things heat up very, very quickly. So by you know, November... Chad, I'm sorry, Chad convinces her that she was going to help lead society uh, during Doomsday. Of course, because now, I mean, it's so perfect because he's like, oh, you're going to be my right-hand person. Yeah. You're my woman. We've been married before. And I guess this is the question we were talking about before we got on the phone call is, is Lori a victim of Chad Daybell? Or is she fully a full participant in this craziness? Um, So within a couple of weeks, Chad is back in Arizona for another conference. And according to Melanie Gibb, who remember is, uh, uh, (laughs) oh my God, I just had like a COVID brain fart. Uh, Lori, not Joe. Okay, bleh. Um, Lori's uh, house. She actually, yeah. no, I'm sorry. Melanie Gibb is Lori's friend. And yeah. she tells the court and papers and reporters that actually Chad stayed at Lori ha- Lori's house as Charles was out of town. Charles is uh, Lori's current husband, yeah. number four. So Gibb said she believed it was a hookup. And that weekend, 
Lori told her friend Melanie that her and Chad were sealed together by Maroni and Jesus Christ in the LDS temple and that the relationship of multiple lives were reunited. Uh, this is also uh, not too long before she realizes that there's a demon inside of her husband, Charles, a demon by the name of Ned Schneider, who's out to kill her. And she is just terrified of him. And then in January 2019, Charles actually calls the police afraid of Lori. He's just like, she's threatened my life. I, I just don't feel safe. Uh, are there kids in the house? He says, yes. I don't know what to do. He decides to change his uh, life insurance policy from all going to Lori to his grandmother. And he wanted to divorce her because he started finding out about this whole Chad religious affair. Yeah, because, I mean, things went kooky, kooky pants, like very, 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 very quickly. Yeah. Um, so... We're now in December, so only a couple weeks later, Chad and Lori make their first appearance together on the Preparing a People podcast called Time to Warrior Up. Yes, Time to Warrior Up. I um, can only imagine what that's about. I'm assuming, I believe the podcast has since been removed and disassociated itself from the couple. So I'm assuming it was a Mormon podcast about conversion because the Mormons are very big into converting people, which is yeah. why they send out missionaries for two years. You have uh, uh, all the men go out on missions. I don't know if women get to do that as well. Um, but they go out for two years into the world and their mission is to convert as many people as possible. I remember yeah. back in, uh, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they would go house to house when I lived in Connecticut and they would ask if they could come inside and talk to you about the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints. Yeah. It was pretty hardcore. Anyway. I so, was visiting by Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, you had Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah. yeah. Um, so strangely enough, uh, Brandon, uh, Boudreau, which is, um, the husband of her niece, Melanie said that the last Christmas, uh, he spent with the family was with Charles and Lori. And he said, everything felt different that Brandon said the relationships were not very close. Melanie Gibb and her family were there and Charles and Lori seemed to be really out in the, on the outs and outs. Now this was also around the same time that Lori told her friend Melanie that she had a dream that Charles was in a car accident and that he wouldn't be home by January 1st, 2019. So she's like, Hey, here's Christmas time. I'm going to tell you that my husband's going to be dead in six days. And yeah. Charles was never in an accident. And when Melanie asked Lori what happened, she said, quote, he didn't because Satan interfered with the plan, end quote. Always. I mean, Satan's always interfering with things. Right. Killing her husband so she can be with her lover. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, um, so <laughs> we get to January 2019. Husband's still alive. And Charles tells Brandon which is, again, the husband of niece Melanie, that uh, Lori was, strangely enough, accusing him of infidelity and claiming that Charles was taken over by an evil spirit and that they needed to perform castings to get it out of him. And throughout the next several months, Charles would allegedly be taken over by three to four different evil spirits that they would need to cast out. And Lori later, this has started referring to people who had spirits in them as... Zombies. zombies and also don't forget one of the spirits was ned schneider <laughs> i mean i just don't and you know uh, chad and laurie are once uh, james and elena and I, it's amazing that they come up with these like normal names i know uh, right spirits like and everything like this uh yeah it's I, I, it just so she really was so head over heels and at this time i think her own knowing that charles wants to divorce her it's it's starting to occur to her like this isn't going to work out. I can't even have him in my life. But also, she's fully aware of his life insurance policy. Yes, uh, she still assumes that her name is on there, and she wants that money. So Chad and her, interestingly enough, Chad would have uh, the people come over and in you know a small group in the living room, and it, again, it was mostly female, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alex Cox, her brother, 
was actually very close to Chad as well. Like he would attend these meetings and he was kind of like the right hand man. Mm -hmm. I see, (laughs) which again is kind of nuts. Now, um, so Charles at this point is like, oh my God, my wife's insane. So there is actually body camera footage from Arizona Police Department showing Charles begging Lori to receive mental help at Community oh. Bridges. But Community Bridges said, um, no, she's not crazy, so we're just going to let her go. And this was around the time that police found uh, Chad uh, on his, because again, this is 2019 now, they have computer records that Chad searched, quote, Ned Schneider, Louisiana obituary, 1997 end quote. So yeah. Chad was taking names of dead people and claiming that that's the demon that was possessing Charles. I need to back something up here mm-hmm. and uh, let everyone know that Lori was t- prior to meeting Chad, she's still a Mormon, was told by God, you have to be on Wheel of Fortune. So she actually was a contestant, no joke, on Wheel of Fortune, and she actually won money. And she said it was because of the graces of God telling her to go that she was able to get, I think she won $500,000. Then you flash forward and she's competing in a beauty pageant uh, Mm -hmm. for Mrs. Hayes County in Texas. Uh, And she's a finalist, but doesn't win. So Uh again, the flashes of, you know, I may be religious, but check me out. You know, like, hey, I'm still, you know, this vibrant, sexy woman, you know, I, it's so interesting. Again, this dichotomy between religion, what's acceptable, what's not. And then this kind of, again, probably coming from her mom, but she's on Wheel of Fortune. It just reminds me of, uh, you know, we all remember uh, the uh, dating show killer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a contestant yeah. on the dating show. Oh, which is, again, I mean, I think there is definitely some, like we were talking about narcissistic tendencies in this as well. And I actually, so um, Charles files for divorce from Lori and I found the court documents and I I just have to read one of these excerpts from the court documents that they were filed by Charles Fellow's attorney on February 15th, 2019, because it just shows how completely insane this woman has gone. So this is um, an excerpt from the court documents. Mother, Lori Vallow, has recently become infatuated at times obsessive about near-death experiences and spiritual visions. Mother has told father, this is Charles Fallow, that she is sealed, eternally married, to the ancient Book of Mormon prophet Moroni, and that she has lived numerous lives on numerous planets prior to this current life. Mother also believes that she was married to James the Just in a past life and also lived as Mary French in the 1800s, who was Joseph Smith Jr.'s natural grandmother. Mother has also informed father that she is a translated being who cannot taste death sent by God to lead the 144,000 into the millennium. Mother believes, this is again Lori, that she is receiving spiritual revelations and visions to help her gather and prepare those chosen to live in the New Jerusalem after the Great War as prophesied in the Book of Revelations. And on January 29th, 2019, during a phone conversation between the parties, which is Lori and Charles, and after their physical separation, Lori, mother, informed Father Charles that she was a god assigned to carry out the work of the 144,000 at Christ's second coming in July 2020, and that if Father got in her way of her mission, she would murder him. Yeah. Because it's all all under, uh, you know, hey, listen, when God tells you to do something and you sense evil in a person, you got to do what you got to do, right? Yes, but the crazy thing is, is that he halted the divorce proceedings and told Lori he wanted to make the marriage work. Yes. And Uh, yeah, that's really quite surprising. I mean, a case of uh, the abused, right? Going back to the abuser. And also children. uh, Boy, in his demise, if if he just want to hop into it, is pretty crazy. Right. I just, I mean, (laughs) and right after this, by the way, um, Lori disappears. So Charles contacts JJ's grandmother, Kay, because Lori has left. He doesn't know where she went. And he needs for Kay, which is his sister, 
to take care of JJ while Lori is missing because Charles needed to work. So Kay and JJ moved back and forth between Arizona and Louisiana during the February to March 2019 because nobody actually knew where Lori was. And finally, eventually, um, uh, and this was around the time when he asked his sister to become his main beneficiary, because by the way, this is a $1 million life insurance policy. Here's his grandma. No, Charles is, it's the case uh, is his sister. She is the grandmother of JJ. Got it. I beg your pardon. Okay. Yeah. So he, yeah, he removes Lori and puts her on. Yes. Yeah. And so Charles and JJ do eventually move to Houston, Texas, because it's closer to Kay's home in Louisiana. Yeah. And according to Kay, which is, again, Charles's sister, Lori left her husband and child for a total of 58 days during this period. And it was later discovered that Lori was in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, Hawaii is so, the place that, they, that keeps coming up in this case. Yes, exactly. Um, and so. Things start getting a little funky now between Lori and her brother Cox. Yeah. Um, on March 2019, there was a joint bank account and it was used to purchase a round trip flight for Chad from Idaho Falls to Mesa. Um, there, Chad and Lori's relationship is super heapy, heating up um, between this time and March. But then all of a sudden in April, Lori moves back to Texas to live with Charles and JJ. And um, meanwhile, as she's moved, like living with Charles, Chad is looking for wedding rings made out of malachite for her um, and Lori. For, yeah. like, so they're planning to get married. Meanwhile, yeah. Lori's back in Texas with Charles, and Charles is halting the divorce proceedings, which is like, that's interesting. So yeah. um, on May 17th, the uh, JJ visited Kay and her husband, Larry, the Woodcocks in Louisiana for the weekend. That was his birthday. And that was the last time the Woodcocks saw JJ in person, which was May 17th, 2019. Um on May 29th, Lori and Zulima Pastines, which is, if you remember, the girlfriend, then she will become the wife of her brother, Alex Cox. So they're having a conversation now about Charles's demons. So she's still convinced that Charles has demons within him. And wants to kill her. She, that's and one of her fears. She tells Alex is, man, I really think he's going to shoot me. And Alex was her protector. I mean, he listened to Chad as well. So he believed her. Yeah, he believed her. And supposedly his other sister, Summer, said that actually Alex um, had had a traumatic brain injury and that his um, yeah. logic was that of a 16-year-old. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so these people move around all the damn time. So on, on June 2019, Lori and Charles moved to Chandler, Arizona. and. At this point, she's Lori's already telling her bestie Melanie Gibb that Tylee went dark sometime between February and to June 2019. Now, dark is when these people in this cult believe that a demon takes over somebody's soul. So um Melanie is also, you know, Melanie is Denise, who is also in the cult with Lori. She and her husband, Brandon, decide to get a divorce. And Brandon claimed that Melanie was in the same cult as Lori. And she told her then husband, Brandon, that she received revelations from God, that she wasn't safe at the house with him. And um, she was trying to establish visitation rights with her children. But they wanted a divorce because Brandon was not safe. And um, around the same time, Charles tells Lori that he's going to Idaho to talk to Tammy Daybell about Lori and Chad's affair because yeah. he had already confronted Lori about it. And he was like, I'm not having this. Uh, and unfortunately, on July 11th, 2019, Lori's brother, Alex, shoots and kills 
Charles. So Charles goes over to the house to pick up JJ and bring him to school. And uh, Alex actually calls 911 after he shoots Charles. Mm-hmm. And uh, he claims that it was out of self defense. He uh, was witness to Charles uh, forcibly beating uh, Lori. It really enraged him, he got up and shot him. Uh, and in the same cop cam, they start interviewing Lori. And there's just no remorse. There's no remorse. She actually makes jokes about like, boy, I can't believe what the neighbors must be thinking. It just means nothing to her. And then days after the fact, she and Chad are starting to sext. They're sending really steamy texts to one another. Well, on top of everything else, it comes out that uh, Alex Cox was, as you mentioned, designated as Lori's protector by Chad in a patriarchal blessing. Because yeah. remember, Chad is the prophet of this whole little gang of messed up people and killers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the the Rexburg police detective said that the crime scene was really odd, that the story didn't quite make sense. Um, because Cox told them that he shot Charles twice in the chest while they were standing. But because of the bullet's location, the second shot was fired when Charles was already on the ground. Yeah. And um, there was very little blood, very little blood splatter. And supposedly Alex claimed that he had given Charles CPR after he shot him. Yeah. But there was absolutely no injuries or impressions on Charles' chest. There would have been more blood if that happened. Um, yeah, and on him, probably. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now, um, there was GPS data confirming that Lori had been at Burger King and at Walgreens. Um, but looks like, uh, she wasn't there. Which is, uh, yeah. comes into play later too, because I believe I saying correct here when, uh, the, you know, well, we'll get to it, but when the day, when the day comes when, uh, the children and Tammy, uh, she's apparently not there either. She's like not at the scenes of the crime which basically point at Chad and then at this point and uh, earlier and later point to Alex. Alex was kind of like the do it, the fixer, the hitman. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was uh, the hitman. And what's crazy is, so she eventually finds out that Charles's $1 million policy, uh, you know, Went to K. and she starts texting Chad frantically. Like, I am so upset. I can't believe that he took me off. You know, I'm not the beneficiary. So that was huge for her. Right. Well, because, that well, that also, and then you wonder if, I mean, there's a reason for his murder, like, A, let's get rid of my husband so I can be with Chad. And then also let's get rid of my husband so I can get the $1 million policy and I'm not the one who did it. So then right. that doesn't mess up me being the beneficiary of the policy, which of course had, you know, he had already fixed. Now, according to Melanie, Lori and Chad were super, super happy. And um, they were communicating multiple times a day. Lori had two to three cell phones, one which was dedicated to communications with Chad. They would meet at hotels. They were intimate. And um, Lori said, everything is totally good because this is God's will, because they've been married in multiple lives and they have a mission together. Yeah. Just meant to be. Um, And I'm kind of wondering, so we've been talking for about 40 minutes. Do we want to make this a two-parter and because there's more deaths coming um there's the kids death but there's Uh, also tammy's death um what do you think um, i yeah i i agree to make this a two-parter maybe just a couple more things maybe even just getting into the victims as we usually do Uh, yeah get into that later i just wanted to point out that uh not after not long after the uh charles murder uh Alex, oh, she, Lori and the kids move closer to Chad. And then Alex moves into the same building complex that Lori's in. So mm-hmm. they're all like right there. Uh, right. But yeah, let, I think, yeah, let's dive into the victims and then we can pick up to the next episode on how they became the victims. Okay. And which victims would you want to talk about? The kids? The kids and Tammy. Oh, Tammy. Yes. Um, well, I, you know, it was interesting because as I was doing a lot of research, like I know 
it was interesting because Tylee was 16, but then she had her own Jeep and she had this life. But when I was looking for information on her, I didn't really find that much. And I'm usually on, Tom, on Tammy. No, on Tylee. Oh, on Tylee. Yeah. Uh, she was basically, you know, a really funny girl, very lively and loving, and was just so excited uh, when JJ entered their lives. And she basically really became more of a mother figure, I feel, mm-hmm. and did a lot, a lot for JJ uh, than perhaps Lori, it, just in that role of mother. Like, I felt like she was more motherly towards JJ. Listen, by all accounts, Lori was also a fantastic mother, but Taylor was JJ's go to. And there's even video footage of uh, Lori. We see Taylor holding a little JJ. And uh, Lori says something like, oh, my babies. Uh, to which Tylee says, some, Tylee says something to the effect like, this is my baby. So she, there was a really close attachment to, to them. Mm-hmm. Really, really young, cut short, liked at school from what I understand. And then, yeah, she had, I think like as her mom starts going off the deep end, she, she goes dark. You know, it's just like this weird, not dark in the way that she has these evil spirits, but she herself mentally is just like so confused. Her, her, you know, the passing of her, the, uh, you know, these the, uh, ex husbands, she doesn't get it. You know, she's just kind of bouncing around. You're here, now you're there, now you're just missing, now you're going to stay with them. Now your brother's going to go stay with them, you're here. I mean, I think at some point she just kind of shut off and perhaps became an issue. But uh, mm-hmm. from what well, I I also. I also did see that she did not like Chad Daybell and Chad Daybell no. actually mentions that um, as one oh, of the reasons is. why she went dark. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So she I probably didn't fall into line. She probably yeah. didn't fall into line with what, all that craziness. Yeah. Which again is like, well, of course not because you're crazy and she knows yeah. that she's obviously a smart kid. Um and she was, I guess, 17 at the time of her disappearance. Um, JJ was seven, yes? Yeah, yeah. Um, and JJ, you know, by all accounts, he was just like a kid, sometimes had difficult times. Again, he was autistic, but it seemed like he was relatively high-functioning, although um, there were reports that he would have episodes that Lori sometimes sometimes found difficult to deal with um you know but what's fascinating is that a lot of family members came out being like well if you couldn't take care of him we would have taken care of him like there was no reason you needed to kill him i mean these people have like large extended families she had a large family uh with lots of kids and um I mean, obviously, there's never any reason for anybody to ever kill anybody. But what they were saying is, is that if you were having a hardship, we would have helped you. But um, like we had discussed before, because Lori believes she can speak to the dead. I mean, in her bizarre uh, statement before sentencing, she says she knows her kids are okay. She totally talked to them in the afterlife. They're having a great time. They're having a better life. Yeah, than they had here. Oh, Let's throw this in there. Two of her husbands out of the five bought her full-length mirrors because at night she would dance to religious music for hours. And right now in jail, inmates say that she could be doing the same thing. Like she just dances late at night in her cell. So that's really kind of kooky. And I mean, I can't imagine if I'm JJ or Tylee walking in and my mom doing this kind of like religious dance just sort of religious but it's interesting to note that her husbands were supportive and like hey here's a mirror for you to do your you know your mormon dance and get your doomsday dances uh jj was uh yes definitely had issues but apparently was again a really sweet kid loved by everyone he came into contact with and um you know as difficult as he was i'm sure for her again there were lots of moments uh, of caring where she did do a good job with him. I mean, you know, to bring an adopted child into any family, I would imagine is, is really hard and it's bumpy, you know, to begin yeah. with, but yeah. Um, yeah. it's yeah. just, wow. I just, it's just so heartbreaking. It, and then uh, Tammy, Tammy, Tammy. Uh, married yeah. 
so long with Chad. Five oh. kids, uh, like a, a loving mother, like did everything for her children, everything for Chad. You know, I but from what I understand, she was supportive of his yeah. craziness. I, I, well, I mean, she was. She actually is. She was born in Pasadena, California, on May fourth, nineteen yeah. seventy. And I love Disneyland um, that she was a gifted, gifted student. Um, she was real creative. She loved putting on family shows that she produced and directed, um, had a great, really happy childhood. Um, when she was 13, the family moved to Springville, Utah, where she was also an ex excellent student. She played the drums and the clarinet in the Springville High School Band. She was the yearbook editor her senior year. Um, she was kind, had a really friendly smile, loved books and loved reading. And she um, met Chad Daybill at Brigham Young University her freshman year. They fell in love and were married March 9th, 1990. And wow. continued wow. schooling. And Tammy uh, looks like she dropped out and was working as a secretary for Springville's Parks Department. Mm -hmm. um, she had a real interest in family history. She submitted more than 100,000 names for temple ordinance work. Wow. What that means, but that's probably something from Mormon stuff. Um, she became a full-time homemaker after Chad graduated and took a job in Ogden, Utah. Um, their family grew very quickly. You know, they had five kids. Um, she loved taking her kids to the public library, really tried to get to develop a passion for reading. And she became a computer teacher at Art City Elementary. And she, supposedly, she was kind of a computer genius, her family said, who had a talent for graphic arts. And in 2004, she and Chad, like we spoke about, founded the Spring Creek Book Company. And she actually wore many hats in the company. She was the chief financial officer, and she also designed the book covers. Wow. And her family said that she was the true backbone of the company. And she produced dozens of books over the years. Um, into really that family. I mean, backbone of that family. Yeah. And yeah, backbone of the family and of the company. Um, she, in 2015, they moved to Salem, Idaho, and she became the assistant librarian at Madison Middle School. And then she later became the librarian at Central Elementary School in Sugar City, Idaho, and she was treasured and loved. And she was very big into the church. She um, did, she was a stakes girl camp director young women president. She was uh, loved by everybody. And she, as we said, we're going to find out, supposedly yeah. they thought that she died peacefully in her sleep. And we find out that she did not. Uh, and, and let's also consider that uh, literally a week after she's uh, she passes away, uh, Chad and Lori get their engagement rings. A week after and then when he speaks to a friend she's kind of taken aback by how he's moved on it just sort of happened after all these years of marriage and he's kind of like she even asked how are you right how are you holding up and he was like i'm okay you know things are good yeah so. i kind of wonder if um if tammy i mean i know that she created the post-apocalyptic post-apocalyptic books and because it's such a patriarchal family structure in the Mormon religion um, if she just became a believer in the cult as well. Like that's, you know, she's obviously a very gifted, bright woman. Right. Was, she, was she inculcated into this cult? And I didn't well, see any reference. Or if not, that's probably part of the... Another the reason, yeah, why she, he needed to get rid of her. So that yeah. will be on next week's episode as we go through what happened to Tammy and the steps leading to Kate and Larry Woodcock essentially getting the police to do a welfare search. And yes. there was like a huge search for these kids too. Like it, this becomes a huge media story. So we will go through that next week as well as the lovebirds flight to Hawaii and their extradition back and more insanity to come. <laughs> it just doesn't end with this case. Yeah, it's it's a lot, a lot of information. But anyway, so um, 
thanks for listening. And as we said, stay tuned for part two of Lori Vallow Daybell next week. All right. Thanks, guys. was sponsored by The Creek Killer, book one in the Harriet Harper thriller series written by me, Dominica Best. What would you do if you read The Police Found Your Body in a Creek? Find out in The Creek Killer, available on Amazon. Thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. If you like my show, please give me a rating and review. It helps other listeners find this podcast. Follow Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit thebeststorytellingnetwork.com where you'll find show notes, my books, links to social media, and much more. Join my Patreon for special subscriber perks, like two extra exclusive episodes a month and a Q&A with me at patreon.com forward slash the deviant mind podcast. Until next time.